Just a couple uh, reminders uh, for the, the guys. We will be this Wednesday. We head off last Wednesday at my house at 6.30 for the Bible study. And as far as the building, uh, we're, it's, it's officially ours now as far as the lease goes. Um, uh, however, it's going to probably take about a, a month for us to get everything ready to purchase the chairs. We're hoping to go to an auction or something and get them, get them cheaper. I'm shocked. The last time we bought chairs, you could actually... Eight ninety nine for chairs like this and chairs with cushion would cost you twelve dollars and you thought you were getting ripped off. And now we want cushion chairs, but you're talking like twenty five bucks a chair. It's like whoa. And uh, but just keep that in prayer. And um, we've got you know Wi Fi issues, things like that, so so we can live stream the sermon and stuff. But if you want to check out the building yeah, right after church today. Um, I'm going to be heading out there. We've got the keys now, and um, you can check it out. There's going to be a lot of specific instructions about where we can park and where we can't park. Like, we can't block the ATM at the Kitsap Credit Union. And, um, but we could, there's different, there's at least three different parking lots besides our own, which only has about 12 slots, but there's like four more. There's about 16. And, um, but the other parking spaces are going to be right next door to it or across the street at the Starbucks. And so we'll have plenty of parking, but we got to do things the right way. And, um, and so we'll be going over that with everybody. And uh, so if you can, yeah. Yeah, what is the address? Is any, a, I don't know if you know the old Apostolic Emmanuel Church on 6th. Um, what's that? 1025 sixth, if Chris remembers right. And, and 1023. He would have, Chris would have put you next door. Real nice guy lives there and uh, doesn't like company. Um, okay, so 1023 Sixth Avenue. And, um, and if anybody remembers the old Apostolic Emmanuel Church and stuff, but it's, it's beautiful upstairs, downstairs. Got a really good deal on it, and um, they're really being nice to us, too. So, um, uh, but if you want to check it out today, you know, this Sunday, maybe even next Sunday, you know, just let, let us know and stuff, and uh, we'll do that. Yeah. I think, I think all of our, all of the church parking is probably going to have to be pretty, Pretty much handicapped or elderly because there's only like 12 slots right there. And um, no, they're not marked. But we're, we're basically, but I'm just saying that we're going to have to just reserve that. Yeah, we can put, uh, up, signs yeah, we can put up signs and stuff. And, um, and then, uh, uh, but there's going to be parking pretty close for almost everybody else. So it's incentive to get a little, a little early because you might be parking at the Starbucks if you get here a little late so um, but we'll have we'll have like a parking attendant stuff like that we'll take care of everybody but uh, but the parking right by the building that's pretty much going to be for uh, you know handicapped elderly stuff like that so and uh, okay so open up to Ephesians chapter 4 one other thing too uh, how many people um, Remember our Arizona friends, um, Jan and Doyle, if you could raise your hands there. And so we still have a few. It's just kind of, churches in America are funny. It's like, it's like every 10 years you have almost a complete turnover. So when I started my series of survey through the Bible, um, almost everybody's gone that was here when, in the book of Genesis. So, so, um, but yeah, they're our good friends. We stay in touch on Facebook, and um, and they're over there in Arizona, where there's a little bit of freedom left. And uh, so it's great to have them. And hopefully, you guys will come with us and check out the church afterwards and get a bite to eat, and that'd be great. Um, okay, so Ephesians chapter four. We looked at the first three verses uh, last week. Now we're going to look at verses four through six. 
And uh, let's go to the Lord in a, in a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' precious name, we just love you, Lord. And, um, and I, I, just, I just love that our church is so united, that, um, that we uh, share one another's burdens, that we care for one another. And so help us to, uh, as, as uh, Pastor Willis was saying, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And this passage is all about the unity that we have in Christ and how we should manifest that unity. And so uh, we just love you, Lord. And uh, people that came here, uh, they came here to hear your word preached, not the faulty wisdom of man. And so I pray that you would anoint me to proclaim your truth and empower me by your spirit so that I would proclaim your truth and I would not lead anyone astray. Pray you'd open hearts and minds to receive your truth and empower us by your spirit to apply these truths to our lives so that we could be all that you called us to be until that day when your son, the Lord Jesus, takes his stand upon the earth. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Now remember, Paul started out this letter um, to the Ephesians. It's all about the church. It's all about the ecclesia, the called out assembly. We've been called out from the world. And Jesus said, you know, I didn't even, Jesus said that the first time he came, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. He was going to divide people, believers from non-believers. So Jesus is not into a United Nations Tower of Babel unity, okay? God does not want mankind to be united while in rebellion against him. So then we come to Christ on bended knee. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and that's the unity that God wants us to have. Now, a message or two ago, it was talking about how the church is to glorify God. Well, that was, that's the purpose for all creation. It's supposed to bring God glory. But because we're fallen... Now God has established and instituted the church, and it's our job to do what? Bring us glory? No, to bring God glory. Amen. Okay? And, uh, and so now we're, God wants us to express the unity that he has restored to us. Unity in truth, unity in Christ. Okay? So we're not going to say, well, this is... Uh, this view is really popular today and, and people are, you know, pro-transgender, pro-homosexuality, uh, pro-critical race theory, pro-Marxism. Look, if it's sin, if it was sin back then, it's still sin today. Okay? So we got to be united in Christ and in truth. But we have to be united. Now, we're, we're going to see... That uh, I'm not, some people, when I talk, when I preach on unity in Christ, people think I'm anti-denominational. Our church is not anti-denominational. We are non-denominational. Okay? And what that means is that if there's a church down the block and they believe in baptizing infants and we don't, we probably need to meet in separate places. Okay? Okay? Um, if there's a church that they're real big on speaking in tongues like all the time and we're not, we need to meet in different places. But despite that, there should be a unity between all of us if we really do believe. OK, so for true believers, whether they're Baptists or Methodist or uh, Episcopalians or Presbyterians, whatever it may be. There should be that unity in Christ. Now, there might be enough of uh, different ways that we interpret the scriptures to where we might have to worship on a regular basis separately. That's okay. But in general, our lives should still be united in Christ. Okay? And, um, and Christ has given us this unity. He talked about in Ephesians the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ in the heavenly places. We're too focused on this world. We need to focus on the spiritual blessings we have 
in the heavenly places. He told the, us, the, he told the Gentiles, look, you were once separated from the God of Israel and the promises given to Israel. But now Jesus has broken down that partition wall and made peace. And we're saved by God's grace alone. It's a free gift. Through faith alone, in Jesus alone. But true saving faith transforms lives and produces good work so that we're now God's work of art. And then he began to talk about, you know, since we are united in Christ, we need to express uh, that unity. And, um, and so he talked about that uh, last week. He, you know, Paul, while in prison, says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling with, with which you were called. Okay? Um, can you imagine, uh, you know, um, uh, a police officer wearing his uniform really, really sloppy all the time, walking around like uh, uh, burping and half drunk, and it's just like, Dude, you're supposed to be a professional police officer. Act that way, okay? We, you know, we act like, well, I'm a Christian, this and that. Yeah, we'll act like that then. Amen. You, you say you trust in Jesus for salvation and the Holy Spirit indwells you? You know what James would say? James, the half-brother of Jesus, he, he would say, don't tell me you're a believer. Show me. Okay? And, um, and so we're united in Christ. That's a fact. If all true believers are united in Christ. Now Paul says, now you've got to start acting that way. Okay? And, um, and so he, he tells us that we need to be humble. We need to be gentle and meek. We need to be long-suffering or patient and bear with, uh, up, you know, bear with one another. And we need to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That peace is that freedom uh, from strife, freedom from hostility. And, uh, and so now Paul is going to tell us, he's saying, look, I want you to be united. And he's going he's to mention um, here uh, six or seven areas of common ground for all believers that should form a unity between us. So Paul is going to discuss seven areas of common ground for all believers that form a unity between us. And he say, he's, he's basically telling us, now live like you're united. Why would you live like we're all divided if we're really united, assuming we really are trusting in the Lord? Now, now, now keep in mind, everybody and their mother's brother calls himself a Christian. So I'm not saying unite with everybody that calls himself a Christian but unite with everybody who confesses faith in Christ and lives a life. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But lives a life that's consistent uh, with that calling. And so look at verses 4 to 6, and then we'll break it down. The seven areas of common ground for all believers that form this unity between us. Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body, not two, not three, not hundreds. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. Okay? And so first off, we are one body. The word in the Greek for body is soma. And so since Jesus is no longer physically on earth, you know, in his divine nature, he's still omnipresent, but in his human nature, he's not physically on earth. All believers, the church, and the church... Um, is made up of, there's, there's local churches, but the entire church on earth, the universal church, is made up of all true believers. We make up the body of Christ. In a sense, we're the physical representatives of Christ to the lost world. 
you know, there's um, that statement, a lot of statements we hear that are just plain bogus, but the statement that has an element of truth to it um, is that you, you're a, you may be the only Jesus people will ever see. They might not come in contact with other Christians. They might not read the Bible. And so if they're going to find out about Jesus or hear from Jesus, it's going to be Jesus working through you, speaking through you. And so since Christ is not physically on earth, all believers, the church, make up the body of Christ. We're the physical representatives of Christ to this lost world. And though we have different roles, we're all united in one body. And, you know, Paul mentions this in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, gave Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so the church is the body uh, of Christ. Uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, take a look there. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. For as the body is one and has many members, like the human body, it's one body but has a lot of different parts. Okay. For as the body is one, it has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member but many." There's a unity and diversity in the body of Christ. We are united. We are united in Christ. We form one body. But just as one body has many different parts, so too the body of Christ, the church, has many different people, believers, with different spiritual gifts. Okay? And, you know, Paul's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians 12 that you know, pr pretty much, and I'm paraphrasing here, the eyeball should not be upset with the elbow because the elbow is not an eyeball. You know? And uh, we need elbows. You usually don't realize that you need elbows and thumbs until, uh, until you injure one of them. Okay? Um, right now, our, our brother Carl, he really appreciates what the, the ribs because his, he's got two of them that are broken. He can't even get out of bed on his own. Okay? He appreciates the way skin works and the tissue works in the arm. Because it's, it's just like tore up. He was in a motorcycle accident. And, um, but we're like that too. We don't always appreciate each other's gifts. I always, whenever I lead a guy to Christ, I start training him to be a preacher. Because I'm like, you know, okay, you know, God's gifted me to be a preacher and a teacher and a pastor, and who wouldn't want to be? But, you know, sometimes guys look at me like I'm crazy and say, no, man, I, I work on cars for people. I, um, yeah, I'll teach people, I'll lead people to Christ and, and, you know, disciple them and stuff, but God hasn't called me to be a preacher. We've got to appreciate the other gifts. In fact, if God called every Christian to be a preacher, I'd be preaching to empty chairs right now. And so would you. Um, and so... God knows what he's doing with the different parts of the human body and the different members of the church. But Paul is emphasizing here that we are one body, one church of all true believers. Now, let me say this. The world is trying to divide us. Now, we're already divided between believers and non-believers. But we're to love and pray for our enemies, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. So we love them and try to get the gospel message, but there's already a division. Those who pledge allegiance from the heart to the Lord Jesus and those who don't. Okay? Well, the world wants to further divide us. Okay? The fact the world would like to really gather the world to crush Christianity. 
Uh, but the world is trying to divide us right now through fear, through lies, through health issues, even through et ethnicity, the different ethnic groups. Yeah, there's really only one human race. Amen. All human beings are all descendants of Adam and Eve. So Christ is trying to unite us in truth and in him, yet the world wants us divided right now. And I'm telling you, there are pastors and there are Christian colleges that are jumping on a neo-Marxist socialist agenda, okay? And, um, and uh, you know, G Jesus said that you... You're going you're gonna to actually have, in the last days, people who call themselves your brothers and sisters in the Lord turning you over to the authorities when Christianity gets outlawed. And we need to pray for our brothers and sisters and need to talk to them. But, um, but I'm telling you, the world wants us divided, uh, but God wants us united in Christ and in truth. So, so, so Paul's using the metaphor... Of, the, of like the human body and how the human body has to work together. And uh, by the way, it amazes me how the human body works. Um, you know, we're getting advances in artificial intelligence and in robotics and stuff like that. But I'm telling you, when I, when I, when, you know, when a missus has me buy groceries and I come home and I already got my school stuff and I got my my water cup or whatever you call it, my thermos. And then I realized I got all these groceries. I look, I said, man, I only got two hands. There's no way I'm going to be able to get all this stuff. But then I start gathering the bags and I start recognizing immediately some things you can tuck in, some bags you got to hold by just a few fingers, you know, the Walmart bags and stuff, and this and that. And, and as I'm doing all this stuff, it's just like, Man, if I tried to replicate that through computers and stuff, that'd have to be incredibly, incredibly advanced. The way we could use our, our elbows, our sides, our fingers, the thumb, the, the pinky. Uh, and so Jesus is saying that the church is like that. It's like a body, but it has many members. Well, the human body, guess what? Each human body that's here right now and each human body around the world should have one spirit. Okay. However, because we trust in Jesus, we also get the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Now, there's people that we, even probably people that we know, they might have a couple other spirits, the bad kind, uh, you know, demon possession and things of that sort. But Paul talks about not only is there is one body and one spirit. So just as the human body, one body and one spirit, now he's going to talk about the body of Christ. One body and one spirit, the Holy Spirit, okay? And so it's the Holy Spirit who indwells all believers from the moment that we first believe. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 19. Paul's talking to the Corinthian believers. Boy, these guys were sloppy, too. So, I mean, it's, it's not just, well, Jesus, well, the Holy Spirit indwells only the really sharp Christians. No, the Holy Spirit indwells all true Christians, even the sloppy ones. Now, if you're being a sloppy Christian, you're not filled with the Spirit. You're not controlled with the Spirit, but you're still indwelt by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 or do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Paul talks about that, too, back in Ephesians um, chapter 1 and verse 13. In him, in Jesus, you also trusted. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, because you believed, you trusted in Jesus, what happens? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And he is what? He's the guarantee of our inheritance 
until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So he's the guarantee of our future inheritance, the Holy Spirit that has uh, indwelt us. So the Holy Spirit indwells all believers from the moment that we first believe, and then he seals us for protection, Ephesians 4, 30. And, um, and we're even told that the only way we can worship God is through spirit and truth, so through the Holy Spirit and through God's truth, John 4, 24. So it's the same spirit that works through us all. Amen. Okay? Um, it is not. This is one of the reasons why we're so-called Protestants, <clears throat> not, um, not Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. We don't see that big division between the clergy and the laity. So pastors are not supposed to be super Christians. They're just supposed to be obedient Christians who get grounded in the word to help others become obedient Christians. It's not like, you know, um, Stella used to always talk about how, oh, I can't wait till we see Jesus and I see all the rewards you get, Pastor Phil. And I'd be like, Stella, I'm not getting as many rewards as you. Stella was a prayer warrior. Godly lady. She was, she was doing a better job being all God called her to be in her own quiet way than I was at being all, all that God called me to be in my way. Okay, so whatever it is, whatever God's called you to, you want to be sold out to him. And, it's, and you might say, yeah, but Pastor Phil, I'm nobody special. Well, join the club. I mean, there really, to be honest, there really was only one special guy. One human being who happened to also be God the Son. Amen. Okay? Yes. We're, we're not special. And, um, uh, but we're indwelt by the all-powerful Spirit of God. And the same Holy Spirit that was at work with the Apostle Paul is at work in us. And Paul, you know, said earlier in his letter... The same power that it took for God to raise Jesus from the dead is at work in us. So we are one body and we have one spirit. You know, it's not like God um, indwells us with angels. And it's like, wow, well, I'm indwelt by Michael the Archangel and you're, you're only in, in, indwelt by uh, Gabriel's nephew. Not that angels have nephews, but... Try to come up with a lower ranked angel and they don't have names for them. And um, uh, no, it's, it's the same Holy Spirit that indwells me and dwells you. And, um, and that unites us. One body of believers and uh, one spirit, one, the, whole, the same Holy Spirit is at work through all of us. So Paul says, there is one body and one spirit just as you are called in one hope of your calling. So one hope of your calling. You know, hope in the Bible means more than just, you know, hoping you're going to get something and you might not get it. It kind of means, uh, hope means that, that certainty of future good. That you know God. If you hope in God, he's a God who keeps his promises. If God promised it, he's going to bring it to pass. Okay? And so this, this one hope of our calling, a certainty of future good. We have been called to be set apart from the world for God's work and God's purpose. All believers are, are to live godly. Now look, look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1. In fact, I think it's... Uh, uh, verses 10 and 11. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he that might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, in Christ. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so, you know, our hope is not in the things of this world. We have an inheritance in the heavenly places uh, through 
uh, the Lord Jesus. Um, verse 14 of Ephesians 1, that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until that redemption day when the Lord Jesus uh, returns. Um, look at Titus chapter 2. Paul's letter to Titus. Chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. This sheds a little bit of light on the hope of our calling. Paul says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation. So you can't earn salvation. It's a free gift. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope. There's that word hope. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I'm hoping you're zealous for good works. Okay? I'm hoping that uh, you want to be redeemed from every lawless deed, that you want to be purified for the Lord, that you want to be his own special people, because that is our calling. And the hope of that calling is going to fully come about with the second coming of the Lord Jesus to the planet Earth, our blessed hope. You know? And I praise God that, you know, I don't think I know anybody here that, that has their hope in the United Nations. And if you do, you need to, to wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, seems to me with most countries to be a leader in the United Nations you got to have a resume that proves that you've slaughtered, you know, at least a few tens of thousands of people, if not a few million people, before they'll give you a position. 80% of the time when the uh, uh, Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, disagreed with America, the UN sided with the Soviet Union. Oh, that's, yeah, they're going to bring peace. Yeah, right. And... Um, uh, so I'm hoping that your hope is not in the United Nations, that your hope is not in the wisdom of man. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He'll bring peace to the planet Earth. He'll bring righteousness to the planet Earth, not the United Nations, not the White House, okay? Only the Lord Jesus will bring peace to the planet Earth. He is our hope, okay? Well, we've been called to work towards that goal. Though Jesus is going to bring it about, in the meantime, we need to, to do the work that God's called us to do. Now, keep in mind, it's all about the kingdom of God. That's the main theme of Jesus' teachings, is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, a kingdom is the domain in which a king rules. So the kingdom of God is wherever God rules. The, Paul talks about the present spiritual stage of God's kingdom when he says in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So right now, Jesus reigns. Where is the kingdom of God? It is spiritually present right now in the hearts of believers where Jesus reigns. Whenever we bear the fruit of the Spirit, kind of Sermon on the Mount, living, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the kingdom of God is being manifest on planet Earth. Okay? Um, but when Jesus taught us how we should pray, we call it the Our Father, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It isn't fully being done on earth as it is in heaven. It's still future. So that's Revelation eleven fifteen, When the seventh angel will sound his trumpet and the kingdoms of this world 
will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So the future physical stage of God's kingdom is when Jesus returns and re reigns upon the earth. Let me tell you, we need not hope in the wisdom of man. We need to hope in God's truth. We need to hope in Christ, but God has given us a holy calling. Okay? God has given us a holy calling. We, was watching, we watched the Denzel Washington movie last night about the CIA agents and all this other, other stuff. And we might say, wow, boy, if you were in the CIA, of course the CIA is so much of our secret service. I mean, there's some good agents that are there, but so much of the leadership are so corrupt right now. But if you were a CIA member, you'd figure, well, I have to be disciplined because look at the importance of the mission that I have. You know, supposedly it's supposed to be defending freedom. It seems to be doing the exact opposite now. But you would say, if I'm a CIA agent, I have to be disciplined. I have to prepare myself mentally and physically because the task is so difficult, and it, but my calling is so important. Okay? Let me tell you, CIA's got nothing when you compare that with being a resident of the kingdom of God. If you're in the body of Christ, you're talking about a much bigger war, a cosmic war between God and his angels and, uh, and the uh, demonic angelic realm. And God has given each and every one of us a powerful calling. That might be witnessing to a, a friend who is resisting God's grace for years, like, like Alan's friend. That might be visiting Carl during his time of need. You know, it, it is crazy. I mean, we, COVID-19 gave us an excuse. That was one thing that never showed up when I keep track of, of all the church work that I do throughout each week. What didn't show up during COVID was hospital visitation or even visitation in houses with sick people. We weren't even allowed. Everything was shut down. Okay, well, now things are starting to open up. And so God might call you to not only witness to non-believing friends, but, but visit uh, people who are hurting and, um, and praying for others. But uh, Jesus is our hope, but he has given us um, a powerful, powerful calling, a powerful, powerful ministry. And if we take that lightly... We're not going to be doing what God's called us to do. You see, God, the hope of our calling, God has not called us to build our own kingdoms. Amen. Okay? And that was like the scary thing about us looking at churches. We had to make sure that we're, not, we're going to be moving into a church to hopefully more faithfully and more regularly serve and worship the Lord. We're not going to be trying to move into a church building to build our own kingdom. Okay, so we've got to live to put God's kingdom first, not our own. Okay, and that's all part uh, of the hope uh, of our calling. That hope is not in the things of this world. Uh, look at Matthew 6. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says this in Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's, that's another way of saying, talking about the hope of your calling. Okay? And there, there's nothing wrong with getting life insurance, take care of your loved ones, and trying to build up for a retirement because you don't know how healthy you're going to be when you're 80 years old or whatever it may be. There's nothing wrong with trying to prepare for a rainy day, but ultimately our investments in God's kingdom should far outweigh 
our investments in our own little kingdom here on earth. Okay? And so we need to be kingdom-minded and constantly have uh, that one hope uh, of our calling. So we need to be united as believers. We are one body and dwelt and empowered by one spirit, and we have one hope of our calling. And so th though God gives us different gifts, we all have the same hope of our calling. We all live to serve Jesus and to build uh, his kingdom. And, uh, and this should unite us. There's nothing wrong um, with Seahawk fans liking to hang out with other Seahawk fans. But that, if that's your number one unity, then that's an idol, and it needs to be smashed. Okay? And um, I think that's one of the pluses we have, is that we got a, we got a Raider fan behind a pulpit, so Tim could attest to that. Tim, you feel a piece about that, don't you? Tim Runyon's also a, a Raider fan, so there's, there's two of us. Um, but I'm getting thumbs down from the back. Very good. Um, uh, but whatever the case, you know, can, can you imagine if, if, if the Seahawks was our, if that, if that, our favorite football team was our God, and if people would say, oh, wait a minute, there's another, Mr. Wisby is a uh, Raider fan. We got three. We're taking over, guys. So that's good. Um, um, but um, whatever the case, uh, can you imagine if somebody would say, well, I don't want to go to Fernandez's church. The guy's a Raider fan. You know, and um, no, it's our unity in Christ, Amen. you know, and I'm telling you, and you, you, might, you might be saying, thinking right now, Pastor Phil, that's a dumb analogy. OK, you want one that really hits home? Uh, there are people in Kitsap County and throughout the country. You don't see it in third world countries. Uh, they're only going to their church because they like the carpet or they like the building. Or they like the programs. Okay? America is one of the few countries on earth that if you don't... Now, this is going to hit home for me as well as you. It's one of the few countries on earth where if you don't have adequate parking, your church numbers go down. Ethiopia, some guy will walk into pouring rain five miles to go to church. Okay? So, is Jesus really number one in our lives? And um, it's easy to, you know, talk about, what's the old expression, the clowns next door. You know, when you talk about, the pastor's talking about other church, oh, the clowns next door, and that, blah, blah, blah. No, they're brothers in Christ, okay? And do they have issues? Yes, but so do we, okay? Um, but God speaks to us first. So whenever God's word is convicting um, a person or a church, let it convict us first, okay? And, um, and so our number one unity uh, has to be the Lord. So look at verse 5. So Paul already talked about one body, one spirit, one hope or your calling. And then he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. The word in the Greek is kurios. Uh, Koryos doesn't always mean um, the Lord like Yahweh, okay? Sometimes in certain contexts, uh, your landlord could be called Koryos. A human lord, a, uh, an official could be called Lord, okay? But when the Jews, 200 years before Jesus walked the earth, translated the Hebrew Old Testament... Into Greek, it's called the Greek Septuagint. The most common way to translate, the most common word they used to translate Yahweh was Koryas. And so when someone is called Koryas in a religious context, he's being called Yahweh. Okay? And in this passage, it only makes sense. The Spirit was mentioned, one Spirit. Verse 5, one Lord. Okay? And then verse 6, one God and Father. Paul's mentioning all three persons of the Trinity. And it refers here, uh, Yahweh 
kurios, I think, is, is referring to Yahweh, that Jesus is the God-man, God the Son who became a man, and he is the Lord of the church. Um, Ephesians 1, uh, 22 and 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So it's kind of like the church is one body, the spirit that indwells it is the Holy Spirit, and the head of the church is Christ. Okay? And, um, and so the God-man, the Lord Jesus, was fully, always existed as God, the second person of the Trinity, but at a point in time, he became a man by adding a human nature without subtracting from his divine nature. So he's 100% man and 100% God. And he is the head of the church. He is the master of all believers. We're told in Acts 4.12 that there's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. Jesus told us in John 14.6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, there's only one God and only one mediator, one go-between, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, but I want us to look at Romans chapter 10 to see how Paul applies the word Lord to the Lord Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13. Paul says this, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, by the way, the Lord Jesus, you can also, if you just take first year Greek, they'll let you know the Lord Jesus can also be translated Jesus is Lord. It is can write it the same way in the Greek. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. By the way, the Romans were forcing people to confess with their mouths, Caesar is Lord. The Jews said, no, Yahweh is Lord. The Christians said, we're not going to say Caesar is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And so if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This became one of the earliest baptismal formulas in the early church that before they would baptize somebody they would say Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead and then they would baptize them Paul goes on to say so what does it mean to call Jesus Lord for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. Remember, one body. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Then verse 13, he quotes from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now when you go, go to the Old Testament, the Lord, all four letters of the word Lord are capitalized. And if you ever read the preface to your English translations, they tell you when they capitalize L-O-R-D, that means Yahweh. So in the same context, Paul is not equivocating. The, the Lord is the same Lord throughout. And he says, look, you have to say Jesus is Lord to be saved. And then in verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord, which is Yahweh from the Old Testament, whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. So that's calling Jesus Yahweh, okay? Um, now, I, I want us to, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna close there, and we'll pick it up because we want to spend a little bit of time on what the one faith is. The one faith, the one baptism, and the one God and Father of all. Um, but Paul wants us to be united. He doesn't want us to be arguing with each other. And that's not just on a local church either. If you're working and on a job site, you know, God's going to want to see you united with the Christians on that job site. 
The world, you know, Jesus said, the world will know you that you're my disciples when you what? When you have love for one another. So if you got a, a, a Baptist and a Methodist who keep arguing all the time at work, the non-believers are going to look and say, man, I don't want none of that. I can go watch better fights at my bar. And um, um, so God wants us to be uh, united. We are one body. Let's start living like we're one body. And, and you, don't, you don't show that you're one body, we're all of the same body, by doing exactly what I do. You show the world that you're of one body by loving one another and then by serving the same purpose, that same calling. And, um, and that is to serve the Lord Jesus and build his kingdom. We're indwelt by one spirit. The spirit that indwells me and empowers me to be all that God called me to be empowers you to be all that God called you to be. We've got to take our calling more seriously, but in closing, one Lord. One Lord. Let me tell you right now, politically powerful people are testing the waters. And they're trying to find out how much can they get away with. And by the way, they're finding out they can get away with more than they even dreamed of. They can tell us, thou shalt shut down your churches. And what do we do? We shut down our churches. And um, they can say, don't leave your home and this and that. And, and then the government gets to decide what's in a, what is an essential business and what's not. So little mom and pop restaurants are being closed all over this country, but these big international restaurants aren't. You know, what's wrong with this picture? It's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, who died and left you God? That's what we should be telling the government. Now, of course, our God became a man and died, but then he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead and conquered death, He's the Lord. Amen. Not the Clintons. Not the Obamas. Not even Donald Trump. Not even Joe Biden. Okay? The Lord Jesus. He is the Lord. And I'm telling you, we are facing a time, brothers and sisters... When the government is going to use all the power and all the technology that it has to try to force you to bend the knee. It's what, what I call the deification of the state. Okay? And they're going to try to get us to worship the government. It's, it's, it's going to be like telling us to say, you got to say, Caesar is Lord all over again. We got to say with Joshua, Joshua 24, 15, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Okay? And so when the government tries to, to, to smack us down and tries to stifle us and tries to crush us um, and the government tries to get us to say that the government is Lord, we got to say no. We're one body and dwelt by one spirit. We have one calling and we have one Lord, and his name is Jesus. You know, I love that my wife, when he started wearing these dumb masks, you know, I don't like wearing a mask all over. If you, if you feel like it's going to help you, great, more power to you. But, you know, I want to shop at Walmart, so i got to wear a mask. So my wife went out and had Jesus' Lord masks, okay? And um, now, you really want to take people off. I've seen a few make America great again. <laughs> That'll take people up, but I'm too old to fight. But, uh, but Jesus is Lord. But I'll be honest with you, though. The media tells me that you wear something like Jesus is Lord and the world's, everybody's going to hate you. No, everybody stops me. I forget that I'm, what I'm, that I'm wearing a billboard on my face. And they, they say, uh, I really like your mask. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm talking to a weirdo over here. <laughs> Total strength. And I remember, oh, wait, it says Jesus is it's like It's like you get bumper stickers. Jesus bumper stickers on your car. <coughs> Start driving the speed limit when you do that. Don't cut people off anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm telling you, the powers that be, you know, 
I'll be honest with you. You know, Bill Gates is not my Lord. Amen. Okay? And uh, President Biden is not my Lord. Amen. My Lord visited this planet 2,000 years ago. And he died on the cross for my sins. And he rose from the dead to conquer death for me and for you. And he promised that he's coming back. My Lord's name is Jesus. Your Lord's name is Jesus as well. We are one body with one spirit. We have one calling. And we have one Lord. Jesus is Lord. Okay. That's going to take off a lot of powerful people. You know? My response is, get a life. Get eternal life. Okay? But my God is the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's the lamb who was slain, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. My Lord is Jesus, and Jesus is coming back in power and glory, and he will reign upon the earth. And we, the day that we forget that we have one Lord and his name is Jesus is the day that we cease to be the church. And so we're one body and dwelt by one spirit. We have one calling and we have one Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' precious name, just remind